This is 21st Century Reformation at 21stcr.org. The purpose, I think, in these talks is to equip you to equip the saints. That's the notion. It's not an academic exercise, much less to win an argument with anybody. But if what we have here is truth in any way, then it's going to make you a more lively and energetic and healthful person. Helpful and healthful. And it is the truth that apparently says, and I remind you of 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 10, you want this in Greek? That is burned in my heart. Because a love for truth they would not receive in order to be saved. Thank you. Saved. So truth and salvation are closely united, which is to me very challenging. I don't know how to process all that in our day and age, but I'm tremendously impressed by 2 Thessalonians, the second chapter, where Paul is passionately telling them to get the order right on the Antichrist and the second coming. I used to tell you these things, he says. I love that. Don't you remember I was with you for three weeks, four weeks founding the church? I used to be lecturing to you on how the Antichrist has to come first and then the second coming. We're not straight on that in our world today. So Paul has yet to be understood, I think, and heard on that subject. So these are various bits and pieces that seem to bear on our Unitarian witness to the world. And... I think the main point of what I'm trying to do here, I can't read all of this, but I invite you to take it home, think about it. How do we get from A to B? How do we go from the New Testament? I'm assuming that we're all scripture people. I believe in the inspiration of scripture, but the authority of scripture. Those people in the first century knew the faith because they knew Jesus, they knew Luke, and they knew Matthew, and so on. The writers of the New Testament, all eight of them, seven of them Jews, one a Gentile probably. They knew the faith. And that's good enough for me. I didn't know the faith in the Church of England where we didn't believe any of these things, couldn't have discussed a single Bible verse with any of you, much less did I believe it in the Armstrong days when we believed in, in two gods in the God family. And we, of course, kept the new moons. No, we didn't, actually. We kept the holy days. But we kept them right. And we paid our three tithes. This one was taken in. Uh, my life lesson has been, Anthony, I want to see you I want to show you how bad religion is when it's done wrong. <laughs> then I want to show you a better way. There's a way of freedom where the book of Galatians is understood. So that's the lesson I've learned in these 77 years, I suppose. It seems very clear to me. I don't know how else I would explain it. Okay, so how do we go from A to B? How do you get from that early Jewish Christian community to the 35,000 denominations we have today? That's an interesting question, isn't it? I don't claim to have worked all this out. I don't know. I'm in process. We're all trying to evaluate all of that all the, all the time. And I don't make any, well, none of us should make any ultimate decisions. I don't get to decide who gets saved in the end. I will ask a few questions here, though, which I think might prompt you to wonder whether that system is as good as sometimes you think it is. Maybe you don't think it's good. It seems to me that it's in, at least in a fearful muddle. And anything we can do to help out to get it straight is valuable. So this is for our ministry out there this coming year. You're all social media people. You text and you Twitter and you Facebook. Maybe that's the forum for you personally. I don't know. But whatever ministry you're developing for the Great Commission, perhaps some of this education here will be good backing for you. So I start with a quotation here found on the internet. To wrench Jesus out of his Jewish world destroys Jesus and destroys Christianity. The religion which grew out of his teachings Christianity, that is, supposed to have. Even Jesus' most familiar role as Christ is a Jewish role. You know that. You know that Mary and Joseph Christ didn't, they weren't Mr. and Mrs. Christ, they didn't have a baby Jesus Christ. People don't know that. They have no idea what that Christ means. It's a Jewish title. If Christians leave the concrete realities of Jesus' life and teaching and the history of Israel in favor of a mythical, universal, spiritual, oh-so-attractive Accept him, won't you, sort of a Jesus. And now the worldly kingdom of God, the kingdom of God is either heaven when you die or it's the state now. If you take on board that, then they deny, this gentleman says, their origins in Israel, their history, the God who has loved and protected Israel and the church. They cease to interpret the actual Jesus sent by God and remake him in their own image and likeness the dangers are obvious. I think it's a marvelous statement. That's so basic. So in talking to people, you say, do you know Jesus was a Jew? 
Many people are very interested in that. They never really thought about it, but deep down they know that's true. If he's a Jew, what does that mean? And you can go from that. So then, does it matter what God we worship? As I get older, maybe more senile and black and white, I don't know how that works. My dad used to say to me, Anthony, when you're older, and I was probably 30 at the time, he said, you'll find that life is not black and white at all. It's all a series of greys. I found the opposite. I'm getting more black and white in my experience. As you study these things, I seem to get more black and white. So, does it matter what God we worship? I would think that's a good question. Here's a, a quotation. The God of the Old Testament is not a force, not even a personified force. He's a full-orbed personality interacting in depth with persons. That's right. So much then for James White, my debating companion, you've seen some of those debates, who says that God is one essence, one what in three who's. And when he embarks on that argument in his book, Jesus, The Forgotten Trinity, guess what? There's a total ab absence of any scripture. Isn't that interesting? He goes into waffle land. <laughs> he goes, in fact, into Greek philosophy, but nothing about scripture at all there. That's at least rather alarming. For me, God is not an essence. He's not an usia, not a being, an essence, but a person, a personality, a self, as Professor Tagi has taught me to say, a self. <coughs> so much then for James White's understanding. Then in Romans 12, you have this. Offer yourselves to God as a consecrated living sacrifice, which will delight God's heart. I love that from the New Living Translation. God is going to be so thrilled, so delighted with you as his children if you offer your heart as a living sacrifice. For this is the worship, which is your gospel service. Probably logikos there is probably related to the gospel. The gospel being the logos, the word. And so the adjective, more than likely, thanks to Nigel Turner pointing this out to me, your gospel service, we're all involved in a gospel service, this is what you do to do your gospel service. Now, a prominent spokesman for the traditional view that God is three persons in one writes this. Our Lord Jesus Christ is God manifest in the flesh, God tabernacle in human form. When I say that I believe in the full deity, and they tend to spit that word out at you, the deity of Jesus, and you're supposed to believe it. That's what I affirm, said this author. At his birth, our Lord Jesus Messiah did not begin to exist. And right there, I think he's gone into collision with Scripture. Reverend Ian Paisley, famous in Ireland. So much, I said, for Matthew and Luke and John. And what if Kushel is right, the book that uh, Dr. Joe was, thank you, Joe was mentioning, thanks. What if Kushel is right, lengthy tome, I don't know if you can read all of that, but he said that Matthew and Mark, particularly Matthew and Luke, I should say, were written with the express object of stopping the nonsense of pre-existence. Isn't that powerful? How could you say more clearly, and I didn't understand a word of this before, than Matthew and Luke do, that the origin and beginning of Jesus was in the womb of a 15-year-old Jewess about 2,000 years ago. I think it's brilliant. I love those birth narratives. Feed on those stories. Marvelous stories. The Moody Bible College official statement of faith says, I quote, God is three persons and one person. You got it? <laughs> they say it. That's the best those people can do. No, I'm not condemning anybody because, as I say in class, this muggins here got it all wrong. We, we've been wrong on every doctrine possible. We're probably wrong on, on some still. <laughs> Had to change our mind on every point. But come on, that's not so bright, is it? Three persons. Tell your children that. Three persons is one person. I loved when... Kermitsali said this morning, they turned the two, was it one into two? Note that duality. If you want to get a thing really muddled up, every one gets into two or three. So two is really, or really one is really three here. You got it? Three X is one X? No, I don't think Blake's getting it. I've got to yell a bit loud to get this over to him. I love that. All right, we must remember, says, dare I say it, the famous C.S. Lewis. We must remember that Christian theology does not believe God to be a person. It believes him to be such that in him, a trinity of persons is consistent with unity in divinity. I don't understand it. I don't get it. I, I, I'm, a langu I'm very bad in mathematics. Geography, I have no idea where we are right now. Somewhere in the middle of America. I don't know. 
but history, I wasn't interested in at school because history is boring, kings and queens marrying each other, who cares when you're 13 years, I didn't worry about that. But language, I had some knack with language, I don't understand that, him, Kermit Zali, him, I can see him right there, but he's really, they, him, and I'll get some more nonsense. My point to you here is that this system is very bad, not to condemn them, but we better get busy trying to help these dear people to come up to one effectively. We need lots of numbers of them so that even our children have a wider uh, chance of meeting other Unitarian folk, you know, happily and so forth. We need to broaden our society of one believers. Interpreters, Richard Hyers, whom we know from Florida, spoke at one of our conferences. I love this statement. Interpreters of Christian persuasion have ordinarily not been specially interested in what Jesus intended and did in his own lifetime. Did you hear that? Whoa! We actually had a meal with him at Perkins restaurant the other day. It was just a very charming guy. And I produced this quote from one of his books. That's amazing. There's more truth than that in that than meets the eye. That's amazing. I would say we ought to be terribly interested in the words of Jesus. John's Gospel only says one thing. You better listen to the words, the words, the words, the words of Jesus, or you're in bad trouble. That's about all John says. Did you notice that? Yes. But in church, we didn't know anything about the words of Jesus, and they largely do not. Thanks to capital D dispensationalism, which says that's not for you. That's my devil voice, sorry. The words of Jesus are not for you, that's for Jews. That's for Jews. You, listen, you cannot be more savage with the Bible than that. Darby was a master stroke, a brilliant undermining of common sense and, and scripture in many ways. God is his judge, not me, but that's terribly bad. So we stress the words of Jesus. I love this. What about this from Søren Kierkegaard? Christendom has done away with Christianity without being quite aware of it. And this then, Jesus' affirmation of the Shema, not the Shema, but the Shema, is neither remarkable nor specifically Christian. How clever are we as a human race? We're very savvy. We go to the moon. We do all this amazing technology. That's pretty bad, isn't it? It's amazing, isn't it? It's amazingly bad. Okay, so that's our task. The world is divided, I said, into many religions, but the three who claim to be monotheistic cannot agree at all about what monotheism really means. This calls for urgent evangelism to do something to relieve this gigantic ecclesiastical model and the poisonous effects it has on the millions trying to find the true God, the God of Jesus and the true gospel. We live, it seems to me, in a theologically con contaminated world. It's not doing your health any good to believe lies. <laughs> not doing you any good at all to believe falsehoods, any of us. We live in a theologically c contaminated world. Mark 12:29 could, I think, unravel the mess if anyone really believed it and preached it. So your question to your friends on all the blogs and the Twittering and the Facebook is, what does Mark 12, 29 say? Is it a Trinitarian statement or not? You'll probably get it. You'll get a, a pivot effect. People want to dodge that question. It's a huge embarrassment. It's a fascinating question. Ask your friends in every situation. Is that a Trinitarian or Unitarian creed there? Let's unpack the process now by which people must be moved from confusion to clarity, darkness to light. In evangelicalism, well known for its claim to get people saved by accepting Jesus into their heart, which I tried to do at Oxford in 1956. And I went back to my room and I said, what have I just done? What does this mean? And immediately I had this uneasy sense about what I loosely call the Billy Graham system. Not to damn anybody or, or be too harsh, but what does that really mean? And I found that some of those evangelicals are by far the most antagonistic to our one God, gospel of the kingdom thing. That's puzzling to me. So what does that really mean, getting saved? I don't un understand that entirely. People are led by a Trinitarian system which is on record as saying that one cannot be saved outside the Trinity. I don't want to go into all the quotes, but you cannot be saved. They all are on record, the top men in that field. And yet our dear friend here, Kermit Zali, says, and I quote, the church doctrine of the Trinity is 
contradictory and nonsensical and has no biblical support. That's pretty amazing. If these are the illustrious men of Christianity and their fundamental doctrine of God is nonsensical and contradictory, that's interesting, isn't it? At least it's challenging. I don't know how to, to process all this. I, I'm going to ask Dan at the end how we work this out, but uh, I don't know. That's at least challenging to me. I have a very naive, naive view of words like this, but if John Stott, who told me to my face, I cannot be saved holding a non-Trinitarian point of view. And yet, as Kermit Zahler says, this is a very nonsensical, difficult doctrine. Okay, Scott McKnight, another one, dedicates a whole website to the Jesus Creed, telling us how fundamentally essential the Shema of Deuteronomy 6, 4, Mark 12, 29 was to Jesus. But just when we expect him to urge us to follow the Unitarian Creed of Jesus, he fails strangely, he falls strangely silent and makes no attempt to explain how it is that evangelicals apparently do not affirm the creed of Jesus. And the end, you correct me if I'm wrong. I, I find this very startling because I'm gripped by that Shema. I think that's just so beautiful and so easy. Apparently, he doesn't want us to be aware of the difference between one and three there. In fact, I'll tell you this, in, in the days when Charles Hunting was still living, he wrote to the Sproul people, the Calvinists, and asked this question about Jesus' creed. And I don't know whether it was supposed to be a humorous answer or not, but they really wrote this. They said, well, when Jesus spoke to that Jew, he had one finger up in front and three fingers behind his back. <laughs> You're smiling. That's the best that that Calvinist or his... They did. I love to make people smile. You know, when you can tell them, okay, then just think about the Mormons for a moment, dear people. And I, I interview them outside Walmart from time to time in a very unassuming way. And they say, yes, God has several wives. And God was a man before God became God. And they shift a bit, you know, they're dodging. They don't terribly like to talk about that. I said, where do you find that in scripture? Well, they said, if we could find the lost books of the Bible, we would find that that's what it says. And you're smiling, but listen, these millions of people who believe that are just as intelligent, bright, sweet, lovely people as you are. They're even nicer than some of you. <laughs> that came as a sudden inspiration there. Take that away from me. Amen. And you can, go, you can go through all of these different groups. This is not to make us feel in any way elevated, but something has happened to you guys that you're miracles. Do you realize that? You are an absolute miracle. A blind man walks into a wall. That's not shocking. But how come you see that wall? And he doesn't. Something has happened to your mind in the grace of God and his providence, which is quite miraculous. I think that's, that will, will remain with me always. Okay, what about then Mark's mention of the Shema in that paragraph is neither remarkable nor particularly Christian. So then the teaching of Jesus is not Christianity. Mm. I feel like the kid in the back of the class, you know, the, the teacher's just written two plus two equals seven, you know, in the back, and I'm in the back row, and everybody's nodding, and I'm here with my hand up, wait, 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 wait you know, hang on. <laughs> I feel like a, ch a child in the classroom. Okay, hybrid Jesus, what about this? The Jesus of Orthodox Trinitarianism is such a bizarre and improbable person that it's a wonder that the church members don't march out on him. Of course, they don't preach sermons on it very much, and so they don't get that chance. The trouble is they do not know, nor apparently often care to know, what their church actually believes. Now I'm quoting without acknowledging Bishop Wright. But is woolly or sloppy thinking pleasing to God and Jesus on this vital topic. Bishop Wright, by the way, is a kind of friend of ours in some ways. He's very close to what we believe in some ways and very far in other ways, but his English is always fun and he's a brilliant writer. He's about a contemporary of mine. I, would have, I wasn't at the same school as he, but we were in the same sort of uh, type of private school over there. So he's, he's very, very interesting and I'm, re I'm quoting later in, in this paper from Simply Christian. Interesting book. He has a translation called The Kingdom of God Translation. Is that the right name? I think so in which he has introduced brilliantly the proper translation of eternal life. So if you want to change the world one word at a time, 
you start saying the life of the age to come. And you give up this foggy, eternal life stuff. Fog. Fog term is sand in your eyes, smoke in your face. The life of the age to come. And maybe I'm allowed to do my little spiel on this one for the sake. But this is so brilliant. These are marvelous things. Daniel 12 verse 2 says, Many multitudes of those who are sleeping in the dust of the ground. That tells you what they're doing and where they're doing it. End of argument. Let's argue about that. No, let's not argue about it. They're sleeping in the dust of the ground. <laughs> Some of them are going to wake to the chayye, if you're sitting in the front row and need an umbrella here, chayye olam. Have you got it? Chayye olam. That's the Hebrew for the life of the age. You can all do this with your friends. Practice your Johann Sebastian Bach. Take the off the end and go on the front of the word and go chayye olam. The life of the age. And the rabbis, smart guys as they were, said, if that's resurrection life, it must be the life of the age too. You got it. That's 40 times in the New Testament. Mistranslated is eternal life. Bishop Wright now in his translation, and of course Ray's, which is even better by far, has the life. I'm working on my translation and I'll get it done. The trouble with translation is you go on tweaking and tweaking and you finally have to say that's best I can do. So you've got your story on Chaye Olam, the life of the age, Daniel 12, verse 2, 40 times in the New Testament. We believe in the life of the coming age, the age to come. Okay, that's my attempt to change the world one word at a time. He's a very bizarre person, this hybrid Jesus here. A recent visitor to our garden tour in Georgia, my wife's a master gardener, in a brief conversation, stated that his Jesus was schizophrenic. <laughs> now, he's a good Baptist boy and a bit of an individual, and he said the best he could figure out, let me read on here, his schizophrenic Jesus, given the creed he was supposed to believe in the Baptist church. And I can understand his perplexity. What are we going to do to help him out of it? The Jesus of official orthodoxy looks like this. Your friends will be astonished to hear it. But this is what they officially believe, based on the creeds. Now, the Christian doctrine of the Incarnation is this, that in Christ, the place of a human personality is replaced by the divine personality of God the Son, the second person of the Most Holy Trinity. Christ possesses a complete human nature without a human personality. Uncreated and eternal divine personality replaces a created human personality in him. The capital I incarnation, if it's a reality, if it really means the word made flesh, cannot mean anything else than this. The eternal capital word of God has joined himself to a human body and a human soul and is henceforth both God and man. Do your friends know that they believe that? You have to first point this out. That sounds to me off like the devil saying, I'm not keen on Jesus, let's get rid of him. There's no personality really. If you look at Jesus, there's nobody there. There's no human personality there. He's not a human person. Awful stuff, isn't it? Do we really need that in churches? I don't think so. And you may think I just made that up. I've got a quotation there, but I'll, I'll do it twice. I'll give another witness, two witnesses. <laughs> not two Jehovah's Witnesses, but two witnesses. I want to rub this point in, I said. Jesus was the only son of God, says somebody else. Man's true representative, perfect God and perfect man, with two natures in one person, without confusion, change, division, or severance. Go on. Jesus was man, but not a man. There's your friend. Your church-going friends are going to a church which officially says Jesus was man, but not a man. You think at least we could try to improve. Let's not damn anybody to hellfire, much less the eternal hellfire. But I, I don't know, it really pains me that people are so sloppy with their worrying, you know, about thinking about creed. That's what it is. Man and not Amen. His ego, this expert says, his personality was a divine, pre-existent, clothing itself and operating in a human body. He came into history, not out of it. He was God working in and through man, not a man raised to the divine level, even if subject to the limitations of a Jew and so on. That's pretty amazing, isn't it? And think about coming into history, not out of it. That's amazing. 
The time was, even after the New Testament, this is me now, when things were still on track, not off base. When word, Logos, in John 1.1, had not yet become, capital word, a God the Son pre-existing his own birth. First Clement, which seems to be a pretty innocent book, it's about right, seems to give us a purely Unitarian God and human Jesus. But by the stage of Irenaeus and Justin Martyr, second century, things are drifting into a strange other Jesus. Irenaeus says, Christ was the word who existed with God from the beginning. And from there, it seems to be all downhill. Clement of Alexandria, I think he's one of those guys who didn't believe in having food, more or less. Our instructor is the holy God, Jesus. The word was the guide to humanity. Origen, who believed that everybody, everybody gets saved, including the devil. He whom we regard and believe to have been God, this is Jesus, from the beginning, and the Son of God, the very word and very wisdom and truth. Yes, but from what beginning, I say? Matthew, Mark, and Luke are gradually being dismissed and discarded by the church fathers, and John, it seems to me, is later twisted in chapter 1, when the word, amazingly, becomes word with a capital W. And so it is to this day. Now, John 1.13, this may be new to you, something for investigation, is originally, almost certainly, a beautiful description of the virginal begetting of the Son. Did you ever wonder why John would leave out any reference to the virgin birth? He probably didn't. You won't find it in the texts of your Bible as you're reading it now, but John 1.13 may easily be a reference to Jesus, who was begotten, not of the will of man, not the will of the flesh, but supernaturally. But you can research that. Uh, I'm throwing out that as a point of research. Okay, over the page then, page three. Once the birth of Jesus was antedated, the following contradictions seem to be inevitable. If Jesus was the human prophet king, he could not be the pre-existing divine son of the father. If he was a descendant of David, he could not be the pre-existent son who existed in heaven from the beginning of time. Presumably you can't be older than your ancestor. That might be difficult. Or before, if he was the son of man who will help God set up the kingdom on a rejuvenated earth, he could not also be fully God without beginning. The reconciling of the incarnation with the virgin birth was logically impossible. But of course, in churches you can attempt the impossible, and some enterprising church fathers tackled it as early as the second century. The apology of Aristides, Jesus the Messiah, is called the Son of God Most High, and it is said that God came down from heaven and from a Hebrew virgin assumed and clothed himself with flesh, and the Son of God lived in the daughter of men. Now, admittedly, that's not scripture. It's not supposed to be part of the canon of scripture, as you know. But it's the sort of tabloid version of the faith. You see that? The popular, fantastic version of the faith. Now, what about this? The Epistola Apostolorum. On that day when I, the Lord Jesus Christ, took the form of the angel Gabriel. Uh-oh. Hmm. I think Ray was mentioning that system. I, Gabriel, appeared to Mary and spoke with her. Her heart received me and she believed and I formed myself and entered into her womb. It's amazing, isn't it? You don't believe that. And I became flesh. But we find the same sort of thing in the so-called Orthodox Fathers. The problem is that that tabloid stuff seems to have infected the Fathers. Bishop of Lyon, of, uh, that's Irenaeus, the word in the beginning with God by whom all things were made who is always present with mankind, has in these last days, that should be has, according to the time appointed by the Father, united to his own workmanship, inasmuch as he became a man liable to suffering. It follows that every objection is set aside by those who say, if our Lord was born at that time, this is the Church of God Abrahamic people saying, Christ had therefore no previous existence. That's what we're saying, Irenaeus is against us. For I have shown that the Son of God did not then begin to exist, being with the Father from the beginning, but when he became incarnate and was made man, commenced afresh the long line of human beings and furnished salvation. So these different Christologies, different Jesuses, one might wonder, created an interesting but incompatible variety of journeys of the Christ. You've got the son of David, that's good, earth to heaven to earth. Makes sense? Son of man, good earth 
to heaven to earth. But what about this one? God the Son, not good. Heaven to earth to heaven to earth. So Bishop Wright then, in dealing with the life of this is me now, uh, ad libbing, Bishop Wright says that when we eventually make it to our destiny, we're getting life after life after death. You got it? Life after life after death. Are you going to help the bishop? How about a website dedicated to helping Bishop Wright? <coughs> Join the Church of God. Huge ministry there. But we find the same thing, I mentioned that, in the so-called Church Fathers. Okay, so then the different Christologies there, i.e. different Jesus, is created an interesting but incompatible variety. I did that. Next paragraph, Psalms of Solomon. You may want to read those for fun. Good Jewish literature, which are Jewish and not Christian, but we're still on solid ground as to the genuinely human Messiah. Well worth reading 50 BC, and they sound like Luke chapter 1 and chapter 2. Very messianic and biblical. Now the real Messiah. The son of David would have the spirit of the Lord resting upon him, according to Isaiah 11. Jesus is the prophet of Deuteronomy 18, although I met somebody by, by email the other day who claims that he is that prophet, and he's otherwise a very rational, rational reasonable person. Isn't that amazing? That's not true of Jesus, this prophecy. It's true of him. And he's waiting for some amazing ministry. He's about 70 years old. And any day now, he's going to come and present himself as that prophet. He's not an irrational person otherwise. It's amazing. Anyway, John 6, 14 has the same thing. The Lord promises Moses, I will raise up a prophet like you from among their countrymen. I will put my words in his mouth. That's the Gospel of John. I will put my words in his mouth. That's what Jesus says about every other sentence. And he will speak in my name. And if somebody doesn't give heed to my words, which he, the Messiah, will speak, and I will leave the rest dot, 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 because Peter says he's out of here. The words of Jesus are the essential point of the faith. That's why we do Hebrews 5.9. This is me head living here. Hebrews 5.9. Salvation comes to those who obey Jesus. End of argument. John 3.36. You either believe in Jesus or you refuse to obey him. So don't buck the command to get baptized. Don't even think of it. <laughs> Never, ever question water baptism. It's a command. You get on with it. End of argument. Okay, so in the real Messiah, continuing here, last paragraph, a portion of the Moses prophecy is quoted again in Stephen's speech, you know that, as he dies in Acts 7.37, that God will raise up by means, uh, raise up by means, that's wrong, God will cause him to be born, Some, I'm sorry about that, we typoed there. And you should know this, that in Psalm 110 verse 3, in the Greek version, not the Hebrew, you actually have a reference to this day I've begotten you. You know you've got that in Psalm 2. You almost certainly got it in the original of Psalm 110, verse 3. But the Masoretes fiddled the points there and got rid of it. You've got this strange thing in 110, 3 in your Hebrew Bible that you're reading. Something about your youth will be like the dew. Yaldutecha. Very strange. But you'll be able to hear this. If you go from Yaldutecha to Yeliditicha, you hear the difference? Yaldutecha, Yeliditicha, all you have to do is change the points. And you get rid of Yeliditicha, which means I have begotten you. Many Hebrew manuscripts have that also. That's a, that's a crime scene. The crime scenes in the Bible are where God is talking about his son being begotten, the origin of the son. That's the crime scene. That's where the system doesn't like it. Okay. Let's then look at the last paragraph there where we, I suggest the church fathers had to turn the word today, today I've begotten you, into timeless today. And as far as I know, today means today. It doesn't mean timeless. And dissolve the real Jesus into a pre-human, non-human person. It's pretty tough. And, and you know, the, best, the best evangelicals today admit that's just nonsense. McLeod, Dr. McLeod says, it's hard to know what content, if any, we can assign to the eternal generation idea? In plain language, it's nonsense. That's a theological way of veiling it slightly. It's hard to know what content, if any, we can assign to the word eternal generation. It's nonsense. Well, like at school, we learned this about euphemism. We learned this in our English class. What's a euphemism? An understatement? 
Tom has difficulty deciding or differentiating between his own and other people's property. He's a bloody thief, my any. <laughs> Theological writing is often so give with one hand, take with the other, and it has this fog. Uh, read it. It's, it's not clear language, often. Okay, let's see where we are here. I'm not going to read all that light to darkness on page four, because there's more history there, and you can work through some of that. But the result of all that, I'm going down to the middle of, of that page four. The result, if you see that page four about the middle, the result of antedating the origin in Matthew 1.18 to a time before Genesis and with the Rigen, the church father, to an eternal generation was beautifully summed up by Professor Loofs, a pupil of Harnack, who lectured at Oberlin College in Ohio in 1922. You see, all of this information, what's so amazing, it's all well known. It's all there in the books, but the public doesn't get it. So in Ohio, he said this. While Hellenistic Gnosticism, that's the paganizing Gnosticism, generated an acute, that's a severe form of the Hellenizing, turning into Greek ways of thinking, of Christianity, yet he goes on to say the Catholic Church did the same thing. I won't read the whole paragraph, but the idea is this. The church fathers and the system said, we do not like Gnosticism. Out! Come in the back door. It's a clever way to deceive people, right? So what you got was a modified crypto-Gnostic Jesus. Not the blatant Gnostic Jesus, but a sort of crypto-hidden. And I think that's what we're trying to undermine here. Okay, turn over the page, if you would. I want to get through this. Page five. At the top of page five, Professor Loof's brilliant guy, pupil of Harnack. Some of his stuff's in English. German is a very useful language. You young students, do your German well. You need it to read some of this stuff. But he described the process of the early corruption of biblical Christianity, how we got from A to B. Brilliantly, this is his statement. He said, the apologists, those are the church fathers that Sean was talking about, that uh, Professor Tuggy was talking about. People like Justin Martyr, second century. Luke says, they laid the foundation for the perversion, corruption of Christianity. And that Greek word, that German word, Verkehrung, is actually an old-fashioned German word now. So <laughs> at airports when I was traveling, I would, I would find German natives and ask them, what does Verkehrung mean to you today? And it's not really a word they use. It's an old word. But it means corruption. It's not just transformation in a good sense. It's not uh, development. It's not evolution. It's a corruption, perversion of Christianity into a philosophical teaching. Specifically, Luke said, their Christology, their view of Jesus, affected the later developments disastrously. We're talking about a world disaster here. By taking for granted the transfer of the concept of Son of God onto a pre-existing Christ, they were the cause of the Christological problem <coughs> of the fourth century. They caused a shift in the point of departure, where you start, of Christological thinking. Away from the historical Jesus. I love that. The Jesus you, the devil doesn't want you to see. Away from the real historical Jesus onto a pre-existing Jesus. They thus shifted attention away from the historical life of Jesus, putting it into the shadow and promoting instead the capital I incarnation of a pre-existing son. Is that, is that comprehensible? The principle is clear, isn't it? The one thing the devil doesn't want you to do is to look at the real Jesus. He will preach Jesus till he's blue in the face to you. Won't you accept Jesus? He keeps begging. But are you getting the real Jesus? That's the issue. It's a simple uh, issue, simple thesis to examine. Don't want to read the rest of that. That's in my Jesus book at two at the back if you want to read it. But I think that's absolutely brilliant. His analysis, I think, may well be right. Now, the results have led, I'm suggesting, to a denominational confusion. Paul had urged us all, listen to this one, 
I want you, my brothers and sisters, above all things, to say the same thing, that there be no divisions or denominations among you. Is it clear? None. No denominations. That you be perfectly united in one mind and one judgment. And Jesus had spoken likewise of the unity of the true followers. He prayed for this unity in John 17. But today, there are thousands of disagreeing divisions and denominations. That ain't okay. Is that right? It's not satisfactory. God is very merciful. I understand that. But our task, it seems to me, to do, to do, is to do what we can to relieve that situation. Then I love this quote. The resulting disaster, I suggest, once the creed of Mark 12, 29, we'll come back to in a moment, was discarded and replaced by a philosophical crypto-gnostic one, despite Jesus' emphasis on Psalm 110, 1, where the second Lord is not God. And that's the major point that is yet to break into the theological world, will change the world. Each of you can have a private ministry pointing out that Psalm 110.1 is the key to the whole thing. It's amazing. It hasn't yet broken. Uh, James White is trying to block all that with clever arguments. But it, it eventually, uh, when you listen to Yaku, our good friend Yaku, former Jehovah's Witness in South Africa, he's working on that very hard. So tell your friends, the second Lord in that Psalm 110.1 is Adonai. This is not as difficult as it might sound. There's a word for Lord God. You know that. Adonai. You all know El Shaddai, El Shaddai, da 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 da. You know that tune. Your friends know that. Sing it to them. El Shaddai, El Shaddai. And it rhymes with Adonai. That's the Lord God. 449 times the Lord God. There's another word, Adonai. There's only a difference of pointing in the Hebrew, which means my Lord, Messiah, my Lord, husband even. Sarah called Abraham Adonai. Didn't call him Adonai. Talk to your Jewish friends and see if they know the difference. Sarah and Carlos were in Israel recently and they would, every place they went in, say, what, what's it mean? Adonai, uh, they just laugh at you. They know. Adonai is not God. Adonai is the Lord Messiah. It doesn't mean God. 195 times. We can have our young scholars, researchers, write all this up in massive detail because you have to say something a million times before it gets over. But that's very interesting to me, that Psalm 110.1. So that's the story of 110.1, and then the disaster was described by Canon Googe. I like this quote towards the second or the last third of page five. The people of God, the Jews, were soon the least adequately represented in God's church. That was a disaster to the church itself. It meant that the church as a whole failed to understand the Old Testament, the Abrahamic promises, and the Greek mind and the Roman mind, pagan minds, in turn, instead of the Hebrew mind, came to dominate its outlook. And so the church became paganized. From that disaster, he said this, not I, Canon Gouge at Christ Church, my own college there in Oxford there. He said, from that disaster, the church has never recovered, either in doctrine or in practice. If today we're coming rightly to understand the Old Testament, this was 1939 he wrote this, then we owe this success to our Hebrew fellows. So that's the challenge for us all. Then Martin Werner of the University of Bern. The church found itself in a dilemma as soon as it tried to harmonize the doctrine of the deity of Jesus and the deity of the Father with monotheism. How do you get two to be one? It's hard going. Have you tried that sometimes? It's very hard going. For according to the New Testament witness, I love this statement. In the teaching of Jesus relative to monotheism of the Old Testament, there had been no element of change whatsoever. Mark 12, 29, he says, recorded the confirmation by Jesus himself without any kind of reservation of the supreme monotheistic confession of faith of Israelite religion in its complete form. Isn't that wonderful? Doesn't it make your heart just sing? He's right. What if he's right? That's amazing. The means by which the church sought to demonstrate the agreement of its dogma of the deity of both the Father and the Son became with monotheism. To make it agree with monotheism, right. How do you make that agree with monotheism, he says, remain seriously uncertain and contradictory. Rather what Kermit Zali said about the Trinity. It's inconsistent, 
unbiblically, not biblically based, and frankly incomprehensible. Okay, so it was not long before in Second Clement. Now, here's where the shift is really shown. When you get to Second Clement, listen what he's saying. He talks about Jesus being first spirit and then flesh. That's exactly the reverse of what Paul said, isn't it? Exactly the backwards of first Adam, second Adam. By second Clement 5, whenever it's written, they've gone in the opposite direction. It's first Jesus, then Adam, in the wrong order. Okay, so I'll leave you to think about that. Now, I also then gave you a long quote, I'm not going to read all this, by Moltmann, but he makes the same point. He talks about the Gnostic misunderstanding of the future apocalyptic stuff. This ties in with what Sean was doing. The whole idea of the glory of the coming kingdom, the physicality of the kingdom, albeit spiritual physicality, and you tell your friends it's very spiritual to have David sitting on a throne in Jerusalem. That's highly spiritual. But the other systems said, no, we want spiritual to be invisible, to be metaphysical, but that crude Jewish stuff about kingdom and throne of David, we don't want that. And that underlies the whole anti-Semitic tendency of our tradition. The church fathers later said, we Christians believe in a triune God. We have rejected the Jewish view and we've rejected the pagan view, which is multiple gods. We've got a mean position between the two, mean in many senses, a middle position between the Jewish era, which happened to be Jesus' view, and paganism. We don't believe in multiple gods like those pagans. We've got three, but they're one. But they're not three, but they're really one, but they're actually three, but anyway, you figure it out. So I'll leave you to read that. Now I'll go to page seven. I'm going to suggest, and I may be entirely wrong here, you can point out the flaw. You put your finger on the logical error, if there is one. Jesus, I'm thinking, was a Unitarian. I'm asking you this question, and for your friends. Could Jesus sign the faith statement of a Trinitarian church? Think about that. Please think about it. That's better than saying, Oh, Anthony, you're saying that all these people have been the Trinity a lot. I'm not saying that. I'm leaving that open. I'm leaving it open on the sliding scale principle. You're going to use in your teaching John 15, 22. You want to put in the notes there. John 15, 22. Jesus said to the Pharisees, if I had not come and told you, you wouldn't be guilty. I see. There's a sliding scale. I wasn't, I think, permanently lost in the Armstrong movement, but I was all at sea in my ignorance. My total lack of any kind of sophistication in the best sense, I didn't know. After all, the Ten Commandments said keep the Sabbath, didn't they? And being the son of an admiral, I was supposed to do what I was told to do. And Jesus said in the Ten Commandments, this was the argument, keep the Sabbath. Or the Sabbath, Saturday. I did it. That cost me 14 years of my life. I was wrong. I hadn't got a clue. I didn't know Jesus didn't give the Ten Commandments. I didn't know. It sounded good to me. Now I work hard against that to try to rescue other people from that. So I don't know how God judges on the sliding scale... But it seems to me, it's not a question of saying, well, is this necessary for salvation? That's not quite the right question. Is it necessary to even improve the situation? Can you help your friends enjoy the Bible when they didn't before? The Bible for me is a tonic now. I can't put it down. I understand it. Not perfectly. In my CV days, I didn't read it. Tried to. We always had New Year's resolutions in January in our boarding school. I was going to read that Matthew if it killed me. And I did, practically did, because I didn't know what begat meant. And I read the begat, the begat, 40 times, and I got bogged down and gave up. People would say to me, I have a hard time reading the Bible. I have to discipline my... I got all these books about discipline. You know, how to do... The problem, maybe, is you're not understanding it. If you understand it well, it's such a thrilling story, you cannot put it down. I'd recommend you sit down and read the whole half of Isaiah in a setting. Have you done that recently? There's too much preaching. There's three verses. Don't do it. It's, it's, you don't get three verses. It's, it's okay, I'm sure. I mustn't offend the system. But it's better to read a whole book or a whole chapter in a love letter from your girlfriend way back, you know. You probably didn't pick up. Well, you might have, but you didn't just take one sentence, put it on the refrigerator, forget the rest. You got the whole thing. So the refrigerator verse is great. It can work too, like Jesus oh, is my savior. He's the... Whatever choice you have, God is love, and you don't put God is a consuming fire up there very much. You very much pick and choose Pollyanna approach to scripture. 
All of which is to say, read whole sections of it. The, the book of Isaiah is a thrilling thing. Because one day those nations are going to sing like you ain't heard nothing. I'm laying that on for any Georgians that might be here. <coughs> Everybody's going to sing in those days. And you have, I mean, the Mormon Tabernacle Choir is pretty good. It's very good. They'll all be so healthy, and they're not now. And the singing will be unbelievable. That's Isaiah 14, 7. The whole earth is at rest, and they break forth into singing. Can you, can you feel the sigh of relief? So you can deceive people on a huge scale. The trick is to look at yourself and say, where has my denomination, heaven forbid, got it wrong? And that's a, a salutary thing to do. Okay, so could Jesus sign that face statement, some of this here? He made a plain and easy Unitarian statement. Again, this is for your cross-the-coffee-table discussions, his confession of faith. And he said in a prayer, You, Father, are the only one and no one else. I'm doing an amplified version there. Monos in Greek means only. No one else. Who is the true God? That should end all arguments right now. Does it with your friends? Do your friends yield and collapse and say, of course, you're right, Unitarian is right, I repent, I'm not a Trinitarian as of this moment. Do your friends do that? Oh, no. Oh, no. They've got their tricks all ready to go. But honestly, that's an easy statement. Sarah is the only ready to person who is my daughter in this room right now. Let's argue about it. We are not too smart as a human race. That is a plain Jewish unitary monotheistic statement, isn't it? Beautiful. We're only talking about Jesus' definition of God. Does anybody care about that? Can you drift into a church and raise your hands and, and, and applaud the triune God? Might you be saying, I don't really think this matters. I'm not sure where to go with that, but it's at least worth thinking about. So the moment, the word monos, you know, in monotheism is straight in the Greek there. O monos alithinos theos, John 17, 3. In his prayer, here he is lifting his hands to the Father. This is eternal life. This is the chayye olam. This is the life of the age to come. This is what it's all about. Is that they come to believe and know you, Father, as O monos. That's only alithinos, genuine, as opposed to fake God, theos. Isn't that great? You could spend the rest of your ministries, believe me, just on that one verse. <coughs> it's fascinating stuff. Okay, so there are one essence and three hypotheses in that second paragraph there. It's not going to work. Three who's in one what? What about 1 Timothy 2.5 in the next paragraph? Isn't this the end of it? Perfectly simple and adequate. One God and one man, in Georgia, one man, Messiah, Jesus. How hard is that? That's Adoni, my Lord, the man. So one God, maybe that's just all we need to summarize it there. There it is in all its beautiful simplicity. That's exactly the difference between Yahweh and Adoni, my Lord, and so on. And Jesus does the same thing. Have you noticed in Mark 12, he states the Shema? I'm ad-libbing now. And immediately he then brings Psalm 110.1. Did you see that? Isn't that brilliant? Our rabbi knew exactly what he was talking about. So you do the same. You learn his teaching methods and copy them. Okay, there it is in beautiful simplicity. Next paragraph. Now compare the burdensome, brain-breaking complications of the creed, which has replaced the creed of Jesus. And here's my thesis statement. Christianity is the only world religion, I think, which begins by discarding its own founder's creed. Is that possible? That's a disaster. Little do churchgoers know that they are assembling under a creed which requires them then to say... Listen to this. He are three, and they is one. I have a hard time even saying that. I have to stop. That's what, according to Millard Erickson, the top evangelical expert, you have to say to be a good Trinitarian. That's amazing to me. Okay, next paragraph down. It is often what you don't say that proves you're not speaking the truth. Or failing silence. Truth becomes hidden under a thick fog of church speak. And this is true also of evangelical tracts presenting salvation, mostly from John, leaving out Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and epitomized by the startling and shocking dictum of Lewis, the gospel is not in the gospels. Live out of that for the next 10 years. Amazing. That is capital D dispensationalism from my angle gone mad. And that's the worst system ever. It's worse than Catholicism. 
to get rid of the teaching of Jesus in Matthew, Mark, and Luke is the ultimate disaster, it seems to me. Okay, well did Colin Brown, I'm skipping a paragraph here, you see where we have well did Colin Brown at Fuller say that churchgoers in their model, quote, they practice, your friends now, your church-going friends are practicing tritheism in all but name. Are we concerned about them? Are we just happy they're there, let them get on with it? Or are we going to try at least to pull them into something better? And Dr. Hay, Joe and I have fun with this. Joe and I have a great relationship in his office. I've never seen a man mark books like he does. It's incredible. <laughs> all marked up. And here, Dr. Hay, we came up with this. It's on the internet. Let us always be conscientious to admit that our doctrine of the Trinity is wholly unintelligible. Hmm. Interesting. He lectured on the Trinity at Cambridge. And Bishop Newman, it's a contradiction, the Trinity is, indeed. Not merely a verbal contradiction, but an incompatibility in the human ideas conveyed. We can scarcely make a nearer approach to defining its exact enunciation than saying one thing is two things. Are we in trouble as a human race or what? Is God smiling on that sort of nonsense? Come on. I'm getting to the hemp hill, you know. I didn't say, do I have an amen? <laughs> I don't know, it's amazing. No, I mean, I'm not, I'm not inviting it particularly, it's fine, but I love the way Joel Hemphill kicks, you know, when he really gets excited. He, Woo! Okay. I don't do it as well as him. Somebody gave me, Jerry gave me some cowboy boots. I, I, not that comfortable, but they're very, very much more effective for the kicking. The crunch of the issue we're dealing with is getting Jesus' own creed back into the church. We're up against such a cherished tradition, this is going to involve some persistent work, Paul did it for hours, arguing, persuading. It takes hours and hours to do this. Paul did it. Jesus had been drowned out and stifled by the popular definition of God as three. Finally, Luke, excellent teacher as he was, bottom of page 10, had from the start laid out the difference, finished with this, between the two laws. Luke is so good. <laughs> Laid out the difference. Today is born in the city of Bethlehem the one who is the Christos Kyrios, the Messiah Lord. Do you get it? Nobody thought God got born, as we might say, in this part of the world. Nobody imagined that God could be born. But now they do. No, that's the Lord Christ. And then only, what, 13 verses later he says that this Lord Christ, this Christos Kyrios, is the Lord's Christ. You see it, don't you? Yahweh's Christ. It's plain and easy to you. That definition is easy. The children can learn two lords but only one God. One of those lords is not God. He's the Lord Messiah. I think that will bring us all into better relationship with God and Jesus. Our health will be better because 1 Timothy 6 3 says, you better believe the health-giving words of Jesus. You want a relationship with God and Jesus, try the truth and help our friends then to move in that direction with us. Thank you. That's all we'll do.